I actually, I, I have a way to talk about Haiti. I actually want to talk about the inequality of Haiti and how Haiti got to be where it is. How it is today, but first off, just recognize, see up, and I don't, so, so here's Florida. Here's Cuba, so, and look how close it is, right? And this is the island where Christopher Columbus first landed in the Americas. One of the things that we, that I'm always so immensely surprised at is when I learn, when I read history, and I don't think I talked about this, the history of Haiti, did I talk about the history of Haiti in here? When I, when I read history, I'm astounded by how much decisions, how much reality today is based on or emerges out of decisions that were made by individual people and by nation states. And I'm ast equally astounded by or surprised by all of the ways in which my country played a role in making decisions to elevate my country over and above the, the welfare of other countries. And I understand that that's kind of how things work in a certain sense. Like if you're a leader of a country, your job is to look out for the people in your country, not to look out for another land. But what I'm most surprised by, or so often surprised by, is how the, the story of the history of the United States, of how, you know, we're the land where poor people came here, people who were kicked out of other nations, people who were persecuted in other nations. They came here and we opened the door and we welcomed them and we made this great land called the United States. And that's the mythology, right? It's sort of like, you know, on the first week of classes when I talked about Native Americans. It's like how these poor persecuted settlers came and they opened up this land that was barren, but it wasn't barren. It was actually populated by people. And we saw genocide here. But also this other idea that that we support and we represent people all over the world. We're trying to better the lives of the, of the planet. And I'm telling you, y'all, right? I, I read, my reading of history is that more often than not, I can, even if I said as often as not, but I'm going to say more often, but let me just say, actually, let me say as often as not, that's not true. It's the exact opposite. Do we actually have made decisions to hold other nations down while elevating ourselves? So let me just, let me just, I just want to talk about Haiti just as a very simple example that I could go to any nation. You ask me probably about a hundred countries and I could give you something in at least a hundred different countries. But here, look, 60 years, that's the average life expectancy of a Haitian today. 80% that's the number of Haitians that live in what the UN considers to be and the World Bank considers to be impoverished conditions. That doesn't mean that people are laying around on the streets dying. It just means that their fundamental basic needs, they struggle to meet their fundamental basic needs. But people are living life. Like, you, you know, you can't look down. I mean, patients are fine. They're, they're getting along. They're living. It's not... Uh, yeah, it's, it's not a land to think about and feel guilty about and horrible about, etc. But it's a land to, you want to really understand. 54% of Haitians, however, live in abject poverty. And this is a poverty that, where you have no chance, no hope, no opportunity of really elevating your circumstances. And it's, it's just... It's tough. And so my look, my reading is, how did Haiti get to be so poor? Like, how is it possible that a land like Haiti, that when you see it, when you think about it from afar, it's this Caribbean island. When, you know, when Columbus landed in Hispaniola, one of the things that Columbus said constantly was like, this land was so rich in resources and so viable and so lush and so such amazing opportunity here. And then year, here we are 500 years later and Haiti is just absolutely continues to struggle. Like what happened? And I just want to give you a quick kind of sense of that. Go to the next slide. So look, in, in 1790, Haiti was the wealthiest colony of all of the European nations. So Spain, France, 
the Netherlands, etc., all of them, even the United States, whatever. In 1790, Haiti was the wealthiest colony of all. It produced, for France, for example, it produced two-thirds, hang on, I want to, I, I wrote this down so I would, I absolutely would not forget it, right? So in France, it produced one half, in France is, you know, you got Great Britain, you have, you have, and you have France, two fundamental powers. It produced, Haiti alone produced half of all the revenue generated by the country of France. Half of all the revenue, y'all. You get that? Like half. France is one of the two major world powers. In 1790, Haiti alone is producing half of that. Two-thirds of all the world's coffee and sugar is being produced by, in Haiti. Okay? Two-thirds. So look, half the world's sugar, two-thirds of its coffee. So look, 500,000 slaves in Haiti in 1790. 500,000 slaves. The average life expectancy of a slave is five to six years. Five to six years, y'all. Think about that. You bring Africans out of Africa. You take them to Haiti. You work them to death because it was cheaper to work people to death and go get more slaves than it was to actually give people decent living conditions. 500,000 slaves living on Haiti. Starting in about 1790, there are these rumblings among the slaves to say, wait a minute, we need, we got to stop this. This is unbelievable. Like these horrible, who, would you, we would all agree, right? This is horrible. You're bringing slaves in, you're working them to death, and what should these slaves do? Well, the United States would say, this is the land, you, you should seek your freedom because you should be free. This is a terrible thing. So for, in these years, starting in these years, slave revolution begins. And slowly but surely, different slaves, different part of the island have these mini uprisings. And it starts spreading. And the French just come down hard, hard, of course, because you can't support any kind of revolution, right? However, in 1804, they succeed in kicking out the French. So mind, mind you, under, just Look, I know you don't like history. Like you can't, it's hard to really bring it to life. But let me just try to bring it to life. The French, in their masterful way, just like the United States, in their masterful way of taking Africans and enslaving them to make profit off of them. I mean, it's a system of pure evil. So the French now have got in this small land 500,000 slaves, y'all, mostly males. And you can imagine just the way, and to hold 500,000 slaves down, you gotta like hammer them really, really hard. And so the French figure out ways to do this. But finally the slaves win. They fight back. Who cannot applaud them for fighting back? And they kick out the French. If the, dude, if the French, it's the Chinese came and did that to us or the Russians, like we'd be rooting for us to kick out them. So the French, so the slaves did it and they kick out the French. However, what happened? The whole Western world, slave only world, owning world came down and they said, we can't have this. The United States, who it suggests recently received at this point in time its liberation from the British. And the British weren't even hardcore imperial masters. The British were just taxing. But the United States, this land of freedom, the land of the founding fathers, this land where persecuted people came and found their liberation and explored themselves to become this amazing place called the United States and we hold the flag up and we salute the flag and some of us go to war to defend the flag. Some of us lose our lives to defend the flag. Some of us do all sorts of things but we hold this flag and we're like, oh my God, this is amazing. What a great place. And some, some of y'all sing the national anthem and the Star Spangled Band and you have tears in your eyes and it's because it's such a great place. It's so amazing. But it wasn't then because the one thing the United States could not have, they could not take, is freedom for the slaves in Haiti. Because if the slaves in Haiti get free, that means slaves in the United States are going to get free. And so what happens in 1804? 
the Western powers, the British, the French, and the United States put an embargo around Haiti. We basically say, listen, you black slaves, you won freedom, you now control the island, but we're not going to let you sell or import or export anything that you produce. Nothing at all. Because if we allow you to do that, then our slaves are sure enough going to start having an uprising. And you can't do that. Because even though we might not like the French, we're all masters of our own destiny here. So, the world powers come together and they say, listen, you former slaves, yeah, you, life might have been tough for you, and now you've, you've created the first black nation that the world has ever owned. It's Haiti, the first black nation the world has ever owned. But you know what? You're going to pay reparations to the French. And the Haitians are going, Wait, hang on, you mean the French who like tortured us and persecuted us and enslaved us and held us down and we had a life expectancy of five to six years? Those French? Like we got to pay them back? And we're like, yeah, you got to. To the tune of like $150 million back in the day. It's so much money. It later got cut down, but imagine how much money that would be today. Basically, we said, you know what? We're not going to let you do anything. From that point on, Haiti became a nation that was, had no chance of ever moving forward and developing this first black nation. But what happens today is we look at nation, we say, well, here's this black nation. Well, black people can't fend for themselves. Black people can't control their own destiny. Black people can't do this. Black people can't do that. But if you don't look at the history, if you don't understand, then you'd have no idea how we got there and how Haiti got there. And how Haiti's plight today, if you follow it up through the years, Haiti's plight today, where Haiti sits, is directly related to its history and directly related to the policies of Western powers and the policies of the United States. 